Well, good afternoon, Harbor Family, friends, and guests. Stoked that we're able to worship with you today. Um, it's such a joy to, to be in this place with you. And if you're joining online, we just want to welcome you. We're going to begin to, today's service with the call to worship. The call to worship is God's invitation to us to come and worship Him. So we'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It reads like this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the power of his word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Please join me in prayer. Father, we just read that long ago, you spoke to the prophets, or you spoke to the fa our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days, you have spoken to us through and by your son. And Father, it's a privilege to, to come into your presence and to worship you. You've given us access through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we are grateful that we get to come. We pray that you would use the next few moments to change us. Remind us that our God is the Lamb who was slain and who takes away the sins of the world. But also remind us that you are the conquering lion, roaring with power. And one day every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will, will, will bow before you. So we pray that you would help us to use this time to set our hearts and our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So as we sing and make music to our God, we pray that you would be exalted in this place, be exalted in our hearts. And we pray these things in the matchless, mighty, holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite you, encourage you to stand as we worship our God who is the Lion and the Lamb.
But moment now, remembering this great love of God that we just sung about, uh, that loved us so much that He gave us His one and only Son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for our sins. And we're reminded as followers of Jesus that the work is still being done in our lives where He has saved us, He's redeemed us, He's adopted us into His family, and now He is continuing to shape us to be more like Christ. And so He does it by identifying sin in our lives and uh, empowering us to, to forsake that sin and to live for His glory. And so... I would encourage us now uh, as, as we uh, reflect before our Lord to just think about maybe the different areas in our life that maybe we're lacking faith as we just sung, or we're lacking um, a, a passion for Jesus. Maybe we are living in certain ways that we know is not pleasing in God's sight, and, and God knows. 
And he has already provided his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And to, to bring that before him and to ask God for strength, uh, for his grace in those areas where we're struggling. So I want to encourage you to do that in the areas that God is shaping us to be more like Christ, to, to bring that before him in prayer. And if you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to use this time to ask God to reveal his son to you through this service. So let's spend a moment now in quiet prayer, uh, confessing our sin and turning to him in, in faith. Go ahead and pray uh, together. Father, we uh, thank you for uh, your provision uh, for our sins in in Christ, for his death on our behalf and his resurrection to give us a new life. We thank you that we are uh, secure in in your love, secure in your family, and we want to live from that security that we have as children of God. Father, we want to lift up... um, Lord, just this, this community that we live in, we want to lift up this island and our state. Lord, just in the odd times that we're living in, Lord, we pray that the church, your church, everyone who calls on your name, Lord, would be empowered by your spirit to live boldly and wisely and to uh, make the most of the opportunity that you have given us. As Paul would say, because the days are evil. Lord, and that this time would be marked as your church as a time of great renewal a great transformation, and that through uh, your work in and through the church, where many people in our community would come to know Christ, we pray for us as individuals that you continue to uh, encourage and empower and embolden us or, uh, towards the relationships in our lives uh, where we are reaching people with the love of Christ, or that through us, Lord, just the good news of Jesus will continue to spread. Pray for our time today, Lord, as we uh, get into your word that, that it wouldn't be just a time of study, it wouldn't be a time of information gathering, but this would be a time of worship as we turn our eyes upon our Savior through your words. And so may this be, yeah, just a time of sweet fellowship uh, with you, Lord Jesus. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out and joining us this afternoon at Harbor New Uwanu. And for those of you guys online, so glad you guys could hop on and, and be uh, connecting with us that way. Uh, before we uh, continue our series, let me go over a couple quick announcements. So we've got um, water baptism coming up next week, Sunday. Next week, Sunday, right after service uh, at f- around 5.30 p.m., right across the street at Ala Moana Beach Park, right across the tennis courts. And so we're going to end service a little earlier We'll, we'll quickly wrap up here, and then we'll just head down uh, to the beach, and we'll celebrate just God's continual redemptive work in the lives of the people in our church. And so uh, that's going to be next week, Saturday, January 30th, 530, uh, at Alamona Beach Park. Hope you can make it out. And then uh, we've also got next month, upcoming, a prayer night with dinner. So we believe that, uh, that God hears our prayers because of Christ, and that he uh, he listens and he responds. And so we're going to spend time as a church coming together. We'll share a meal together downstairs in the open air lanai, and we'll, um, we'll have food, bring your own drinks, and we'll uh, spend some time praying for our church, uh, for God's continual work in our congregation, as well as we'll spend time praying for our community. That's going to be uh, February 12th, Saturday, February 12th at 5.30 downstairs. And you can talk to me if, uh, if you want more info about that, or you can email me at johnhan at harborhawaii.org. And then finally, we've got uh, available uh, on our Aloha table, we've got our 2021 um, just statement of activity, our, our, um, our uh, just uh, uh, on, on the financial end, just uh, the different digits as far as financial giving and whatnot. And so uh, we have that available for you. And we just want to, again, just praise God for the work that he is doing in our church. And we thank you for just your generous giving uh, throughout 
uh, this past year, 2021, as we've just seen, yeah, just God work powerfully in the lives of people in our church and in the people uh, around us. And so that's available on your way out if you want to pick it up on our Aloha table. All right, so um, last thing, real quick, is online. We've got our online bulletins. So if you're joining us online, you want to follow along with the passage and, and, and the lyrics and the announcements, you can go ahead and go to our website, harbornuwano.org, and then on our top page, we've got a link to our online bulletin so that you can be following along with us. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get into our passage today in Luke chapter 16, as we began a new series on this, this idea of this theme of today, now is a time of opportunity. Now is a time of new beginnings uh, as, as we have these fresh starts that Jesus gives. Um, so I wanted to start off this way as we get into today's passage, starting with verse 14, is have you ever thought uh, that, that, that you were cool with someone uh, and really you found out that, that you weren't? Like things were great, you thought, with someone, and then later on you find out, oh gosh, actually they have an issue with, with me. I remember one of my first few years as a, as, a, um, as a school teacher, I thought I was connecting with my classes. I thought my students loved me. Uh, here's this kind of younger guy that kind of understands middle schoolers that's, and is able to connect with their students. So I thought that I had a great connection with my kids. And then um, a few months into the school year, uh, one of the students came up to me and basically told me, and, and this person was very straight up, like, you act like you connect with us, but you don't connect with us. And, uh, and I, I felt pretty devastated as a teacher. I mean, middle schoolers can be very real, but also very blunt. Yeah? They, they, don't, they don't really cover things up very easily. And so this person was just blunt with me, like, you, you act like you connect with us, but you don't. And so I was shocked, because I thought I was in. Like, I thought I was connecting with, with, with my students, and things were going great, but it wasn't. And so that, that just had me just rethink how I even did my teaching. Uh, that, that, was pretty, that was pretty devastating for me as a, uh, as a teacher for that year. But you ever had that where you thought, you thought that a certain relationship was great and that you thought the other person uh, thought it was great, but then you find out that it wasn't. Like, um, and the way that you find out often isn't through that person. It's through a coworker. It's through a friend. It's through somebody else that says, hey, you know that person has an issue with you? And you're like, what? I totally didn't know that things were not great with, with, with that person, and you only find out later. Or maybe the opposite, where maybe you had a time, I know for me there are times like this, where I thought someone else had an issue with me. I thought someone else uh, had something against me. You know, maybe they don't say hi to me back, or maybe they don't talk as long with me as they did before, or maybe their just facial expression looks a little less happy uh, when our eyes uh, connect, and we think, ah, oh, they must not like me because I didn't return their call. I didn't return their text. I didn't do such and such. I forgot their birthday. I forgot their anniversary. That's why they got an issue with me. And then later on, you know, I find out, no, they had absolutely no issue with me. They were having just a tough week or, you know, their facial expression just, you know, I just misinterpreted their intentions. I misinterpreted their thoughts towards me while I'm trying to, you know, paint this this, this picture of what they're thinking about me in my mind, it's totally not the case. And they had no issue with me. We're cool. And I only find out later. So here I am getting really stressed out about a false narrative that I concocted in my own mind because of my false interpretation. You ever had that? Right? There are times where we can misinterpret our relationships. We can misinterpret whether or not we're in a good spot with somebody else. Now, what about our relationship with God? Right? What about our relationship with God? How do we know when we are in a right standing with God? You know, maybe for some people, they think, oh, if everything's going right in my life, if I'm doing good financially, if all my relationships are going great, I'm not experiencing any kind of illnesses or long-term health problems, then God must love me. He must favor me. Maybe we think, you know, maybe we might think that way. Or maybe we might think if things are really hard in our lives, God must not be favorable towards us. If health is an, an ongoing battle, an issue for us, if our relationships uh, are very tense-filled and conflict-filled, if our finances and, and, and our just general living is difficult and challenging and we feel like we're just trying to make it every day, then we might be, interpret those circumstances as God must not look favorably upon me because life is so hard. 
Right? How do we know if we are in right standing, cool, quote unquote cool, with, with God? See, the religious leaders in Jesus' time, they thought that they were in good standing with God because, for the most part, they were wealthy. For the most part, they had a high standing in society. Even the people in Jesus' time in general thought that a person's wealth showed that God looked favorably upon them. But we're going to see that that's not the case. In fact, last week, when we first launched our series, we looked at how Jesus talked about money and this, this idea of wealth and how we, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve both God and money and how temporary wealth and money is. And so we were challenged by Jesus last week that we are to use the different things that God has given us to serve God and to love our neighbor. And so when the religious leaders heard about this, as we get into today's passage, they're not going to be happy with that message. And so we're going to be looking, okay, so what does then favor with God, a right standing with God, being cool with God, look like then if it's not wealth? So let's jump right into it in verse 15 in Luke chapter 16, as Jesus continues his teaching. Verse 14 says, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, right? Jesus is teaching on wealth, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. See, the Pharisees loved money. And when Jesus was talking about money, that you can't serve both God and money, they, Jesus hit a nerve there. And, and, and they responded in making fun of Jesus. Right here, Jesus is, he was a poor man. Right? He grew up in poverty. He wasn't wealthy. And so the religious leaders could look at him and say, what, he's poor? He's not favored by God. This guy doesn't even own a home. So why should, we, why should anyone listen to him? God does not favor him because he does not have money. He's not wealthy. And they ridiculed Jesus. They justified themselves before men. But they could not hide their, their relationship with God from God. Although they appeared to know God, and the people in their sphere of influence believed that they were close to God because of their status and because of their wealth, they were really far from Him. And the point being here is that this idea of having an outward religious life doesn't mean that we're a part of the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that we're cool with God. It doesn't mean that we're right with God, to have an outward religious life. Because these religious leaders had a lot of things, right? They, they studied the Bible, the Old Testament. They said religious prayers. They attended religious gatherings. They did outward signs, and, and they gave, right? They, they, they offered you know, their resources to the temple. They did things religiously outwardly, but that didn't mean that they were really a part of God's family and God's kingdom. Things like spiritual disciplines, right? good things, like reading our Bibles and, and praying and, and, and serving other people and caring for the poor and using talents uh, to serve other people. Those are all good things, but in and of themselves, they don't identify whether or not we're really in the kingdom of God. Right? I can do a lot of things like um, uh, in, in sports. I, I could do a lot of drills in, let, let's say, you know, let's say soccer. I can do a lot of soccer drills that are good and that help a person become a better soccer player. But that doesn't mean that I'm a professional soccer player. That doesn't mean I'm in. I can be doing all the drills, but it doesn't mean I'm in. The drills are good. The drills build skill, and, and the pros need it to get better. But me doing it doesn't get me in. So a person can do spiritual activities, but it doesn't get them into the kingdom of God. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they can do all these spiritual practices outwardly, but it doesn't mean that they're right with God because spiritual uh, or any kind of outward religious practices cannot save. They're good, but they cannot save a person. But neither can a life that, that compromises God's word a life that doesn't want to live under God's authority. And that's what we're going to look at next. Jesus says this, The law and the prophets were until John. 
Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Okay, we're reading this and we're like, whoa. Like, how are we, how are we tracking with Jesus? We went from wealth, we went from the Pharisees ridiculing Jesus, to the law and the prophets, to marriage and, adult, and, and adultery and divorce. If we're reading this, we're kind of like, what? Like, is, is this like scattered teachings? Like, this seems super random. But, but it's all connected. And, and we'll see this, right? So here, right, here are the Pharisees thinking that they're in, thinking that they know God. And then Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. Right? He, he says that everyone is forcing their way into the kingdom. For the religious leaders, it's, it's by living this outward religious life while being inwardly right, absent from God. That does not get you in the kingdom of God. The people in, in, in Jesus' time, like the zealots, used violence as they tried to overthrow the Roman government and bring violence in order to, to advance the kingdom of God. Well, violence does not bring us into the kingdom of God. There are other people who lived a life of compromise that maybe had an outward uh, religious life but, but chose to not obey and listen to God's law. Here in verse 16, where it says, The law and the prophets were until John, since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone is, forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Some people might think, well, I don't need God's law. I don't need to follow God's word. I can do it my own way to get into the kingdom of heaven. But that's not the case. When Jesus came, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right? So a person cannot say, oh, I can live life away from God's word, and I'm good, I'm in the kingdom. No, but in a sense, that's what the people in Jesus' day were doing, some of them. And Jesus gave them example, right, in verse 18. Just as the law, God's word, does not pass away, Jesus gives an example of marriage. Marriage is meant to be permanent, right, between one man and one woman in a covenant before God. It's meant to be permanent. And just as it's permanent, God's word is permanent and cannot be broken. So Jesus is using a connection there, the permanence of God's word and marriage. But Jesus is also pointing out to the people that the people weren't obeying God's word. And he was giving them an example of that through marriage, where, where, where he says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. You see, in Jesus' time, there was a, a, a group of religious leaders who taught that a person could divorce their wife for ridiculous reasons. So one example given was if a woman didn't prepare uh, food in a way that the husband liked it, he could divorce, he had the permission to divorce his wife. Can you imagine the stress? Like, right, like if I don't prepare my meal right, then my husband can divorce me. It has religious grounds to divorce me. So there was a religious group in Judaism in that time that gave that kind of permission for people to divorce their wives. And Jesus is saying here, right, here's what Jesus is not doing. He's not giving a whole teaching on divorce and marriage, right? Uh, he spends time in other places. So that's why we're not going to really get into like the different ways that the Bible talks about divorce. You know, whether it be a, a non-Christian leaving a, a, a Christian or whether it be due out of, um, of unfaithfulness, right? Jesus here is not going into a teaching on marriage. He's just giving an example of how the religious leaders and the people of, of, of his day were not following God's word, right? They were compromising God's word. And it was here that they were divorcing their spouse, their wife, in order to marry another woman. That's what's going on here. That's what Jesus pointed out. And the religious leaders were condoning that. They were letting these guys divorce their wives in order to marry someone else. Right? Again, think about some of the rules that were going on there. Like if the wife burned the food, you could, you could divorce. Another rule was if, 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 if the, the husband just wasn't pleased with the wife, then the husband can simply divorce her. And so this was, right, sin in God's sight because marriage was meant to be lifelong. Just as God's word, right, does not 
go void. God's word does not break up. So Jesus was giving an example here how marriage, it's lifelong, just as God's word, right, doesn't, doesn't stop. And the point being here, right, is that a life of compromise, compromising God's word, doesn't get us into the kingdom of God. Right? We might think, or doesn't have us experience the full, the full weight of the kingdom of God. Right, there are times that even we as followers of Jesus who have been forgiven and saved and redeemed, we struggle with compromise because we think that our way might be better. Just as these, these people here right, thought, you know what? Like, my life would be better if I divorce my wife and marry this other person because she's better than, than, than my wife. It just seems better that way, so I'm going to go with it. See, compromise at times, right? we might think that a certain way of life is better knowing that God's word says otherwise. Right? Maybe you might think, you know, that, that, that uh, in a certain relationship, a certain situation, we are uh, wanting to just, like, tell the other person off. Like, we're angry, we're frustrated with this. It might be a family member, it might be a friend. And our, our temptation is, you know, compromising. We know God's word says to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, right? to be patient by the power of the Spirit. But we think, no, I've had enough of that. It's just better if I tell the person off in a real harsh, demeaning, mean way because there's no other way they're going to wake up. I'm just going to blast them with my words. Right? And, and we think, okay, that, that's the way to do it. Knowing that, no, that's not, that's not what God's Word says to do it. But we think, no, it just feels better to do this way. I'm going to do it in that way. Or, or, or maybe right, we're, we're struggling with compromise in certain areas where we think, gosh, like, if only I got that thing, then I'll finally be content with my life. I know God's word says to be content with what I have, that Christ is enough, but I just feel like if I just buy that new device, if I just own that new property, if I just get that, then I'll really be happy. I know it's compromising. I know that's not a wise decision. I know that's going to get me financially in trouble, but I just think I need it. So I'm going to compromise and go for it because I think that's better. Right? But in the, in the long run and in the end, right, when we compromise God's word, right, we miss out on, on the joy and on the satisfaction that only Christ can give and that these other things that we can give into leaves us empty. And not only that, it, when we give into compromise in our lives, we end up hurting the people around us. Just as these men were compromising God's word, they were divorcing their wives, they were causing heartbreak and heartache to their wives that they're divorcing, to the children that would experience the brokenness of that divorce, and, and to whoever else in, in, in their, their sphere of life that they, were, uh, that, were, that they were impacting. Compromise doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. And here, they were living a life of compromise. That doesn't get us to experience the kingdom. But neither does having a high status or wealth. Let's go to verse 19. Jesus is going to come back to wealth. He says this, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted uh, sumptuously every day. And at, at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in, in like manner had bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. 
Remember we talked about in Jesus' time, the people thought that if a person had wealth, that showed that they were in favor with God. It showed that God shined favorably upon them. But here Jesus gives this story of a man who was wealthy, but who ended up in hell. Right? In eternal, conscious torment and punishment for his sins. So wealth and status does not get a person into the kingdom of God. Lazarus, uh, the poor man, right? he had faith in God. He wasn't brought into heaven because he was poor. Poverty didn't bring him into heaven. He had faith in, in God. And he suffered in this life. So just because a person is poor doesn't mean that God is not shining favorably upon them. He had faith in God. He died and he's brought into heaven while this rich man suffers for eternity in hell. And when we think about this, right, we might read this story and think, wow, like this seems kind of harsh. Like here is, is uh, the rich man in torment and, and he, he wants his brothers to, 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 to turn away from their sin of worshiping wealth and, and, and money and status. And he wants them uh, to repent and to turn to God. And uh, he's unable to, to leave that place. And here's what it teaches us about hell, is that, number one, it is eternal. Number two, it's, it's conscious. There, there are some religions that teach that hell is, is uh, you know, you're, 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 you lose consciousness, you're forever just, just zapped out of existence. But here, um, the rich man is conscious of his punishment. He's conscious of it. Also, it's permanent. Right? He cannot get out of it. There is no like waiting, waiting period, middle ground that he can buy his way out of. It is permanent that he is there. There's no second chance. He, is, he had one chance and he is there permanently in eternal conscious punishment. And again, we might struggle with that and think, gosh, that, that seems harsh. God, that seems hard. But here's something that's interesting. Is the rich man, nowhere does he object to God's um, verdict on his life. Nowhere does this guy say, God, this is unfair. Why am I in this eternal conscious punishment for my sins? That is unfair. You're unjust. Notice he never brings it up. He never brings it up. Right? He, he accepts his fate with no uh, objection. You see, in, in our lives right now, we live in a fallen world. And even in our own lives, right, our minds and our emotions Right? They're tainted with sin. And because of that, we're unable to rightly judge people and circumstances perfectly. Right? We know that right? when we're super mad at people. We, we, we know we're not judging them like, like rationally and thoughtfully. We need other people to help. Um, and, and, and so um, when we think about hell, right, eternal conscious punishment, right, our, our minds cannot rightly think about God's justice in, in a perfect way the way that he does. Think of it like a, a, a child, right? When a child is being disciplined by a loving parent or by a loving teacher, they might think, this is so unfair, this is not a just punishment, right? But then as a child, and we may have experienced this, when we get older and we become adults and we look back, we say, oh, we totally deserve that punishment, right? As kids, we don't understand at times why a parent or a teacher or an authority figure would, would, uh, would discipline us. And we think it's unfair, but when we get older, we realize, oh, you know what? They're right. See, when a person's in hell, there is going to be no one that says this is unfair, but they'll all say that is just. This is just. It's just that we living in this fallen world, dealing with sin in our own lives, we, we can't understand it perfectly the way that God does. But when everyone stands before God, we'll, we'll declare, no, he is right and just in all of his ways. To judge the sinner and to show mercy upon those right, who have trusted in him. So if wealth and status does not save, does not bring us into the kingdom, then who does? Well, here's what Jesus says right, at the end of this story. Right, this rich man wants to go back and, and tell his relatives, his brothers uh, about, uh, wants Lazarus to go back and tell his, his brothers uh, to, to watch out. And what does Abraham say? He says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he's like, no, but if someone rises from the dead, like, gosh, that's going to convince them. But he says, no. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, 
neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. We might think that in order for someone to believe in Jesus, they need to see a miracle, just something amazing. Someone just comes back to life. If something just miraculous were to happen, someone gets healed of a terminal illness, and that's going to bring them to Jesus. But miracles, as we learn here, it'll just shock a person. It might, it might have them uh, just be in awe of a situation, but it cannot bring a person to trust in Jesus. Here, um, Abraham says, it is Moses and the prophets. What does that mean? What does that mean they have Moses and the prophets? Luke helps us out here. Luke uses that phrase later on in chapter 24, verse 27. Jesus raises from the dead, and here's what he tells his followers. Luke 24, 27. I think I have it on the slide. I'll turn it down. All right, Jesus said this. And beginning, sorry, uh, Luke writes this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them the disciples, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Wait, so what does that mean? That means that when we read Moses, that's the law, and the prophets, that's the rest, that's the Old Testament. So when we read the Bible, when we read the Old Testament, we're to remember that the ultimate goal of it is to lead us to our Savior and King Jesus. In other words, it is only through faith in Jesus are we brought into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God. Wealth and status doesn't get us in. Outward religious practices don't get us, get us in. Living our own lives and compromise doesn't get us in. It's only through faith in Jesus' death on the cross, taking our sin. Every time that we live for wealth, every time we worship status, every time we compromise in our lives, every time we, we, we live in a fake, hypocritical way, just like the Pharisees, Jesus died for all of those sins on the cross. He took the punishment for us. So that through faith in his death and in his resurrection, we are declared righteous in his sight. Not through anything that we have done, but through his perfect life lived out on our behalf, being our substitute on the cross. That's how we are made right with God. That's how we know we're cool with God. That's how we know that we stand before God forgiven and accepted. It is only through faith and his son, as Jesus said, that everyone is trying to get into the kingdom. They're forcing their way in. But Jesus says in the Gospel of John that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. It is only through him. And we're going to rest in that today. Maybe we struggle with that as Christians, thinking that it's, it's what we do that gets us God's love, what we do that gets us God's favor. No, it's, it's through faith in Christ that we experience the blessings of God. And we're going to remember that truth and that good news as we take communion. We take of the cracker uh, representing his body that he uh, gave on the cross. And we drink of the juice that represents his blood shed so that we could have life with him forever. And so I want to encourage you, if you are a follower of Jesus, to take communion during our time of, of singing to him. Uh, it's available on our back table. If you're joining us online, I would encourage you to gather the communion elements. And then secondly, as we think about the good news of Jesus, right? a second way we can worship God and respond to his great love is through loving him through uh, giving back, and that's through financial giving, advancing the gospel through the local church. And you can do that online at harbornewwano.org. So let's go ahead now and worship the one who brings us into the kingdom, not through violence, not through religion, not through compromise or wealth or status, but only through the blood of Christ are we brought in. And so let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is uh, the way to be made right with you. And we celebrate that it is not through our efforts, but through faith, trust in him. And we want to live from that, that, that life that he has given us as we celebrate by taking communion, as we celebrate by singing to you. So continue the work you're doing in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I encourage you as, as we continue our, our time of worship to, to sing to him if you want to stand and sing or to go and take communion or continue just meditating on his good promises to us.
We're going to go ahead and close today's service with a doxology, or rather a praise to God from the book of Jude. It reads like this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. May we go out remembering and celebrating that only Jesus, Jesus can receive us into the kingdom. So as we receive the love of Jesus, may we share the love of Jesus with others. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We pray that the Lord blesses your week. God bless you all.